Hello, thanks for coming. And uh, here we go. Here's my topic. Uh, give you an idea, what a little better idea of what I'm going to talk about. The terminology L values and R values is something that, um, well, it's not really a language feature. It's a property of expressions. And so L values and R values are often, in my experience, is they're not taught in the same way as you would teach somebody how to write an assignment expression or how to write a for loop or how to declare a function. It's just that in the course of talking about that stuff, every so often the word L value and R value will come up. But my experience is that an awful lot of programmers struggle through certainly their early part of their career, I mean, in either C or C++ with this, well, I sort of, I see these things in error messages, but I don't really know what they are. And I don't really know why I should care that much, <clears throat> other than the fact that the compiler mutters it back at me every so often. But it turns out that insight into L values and R values affects a whole bunch of aspects of C++ that I think really do influence code quality. In particular, first thing is that it gives you better insight into the behavior of the built-in operators. And better insight into what's happening underneath the hood, what kind of code the compiler will generate for you when you write certain kinds of expressions. And as I mentioned, every so often the compiler will mention that you've done something wrong, it'll give you an error message, and the word L value or R value will be somewhere in there. Now, a lot of C and C++ programmers, the way their attitude toward error messages is they look at the file, and they look at the line number, and they don't read the message. They just say, there's something wrong somewhere around here, and maybe I can figure out what it is. But once you understand L values and R values, it turns out the error messages actually have some meaning. For C++ programmers, the, where this really pays off is that reference types, the real understanding of reference types comes with an understanding of how they interact with L values and R values. And whether you are an author of an overloaded operator or whether you're just the user of somebody else's overloaded operators, it turns out that you get real insight into how to write these things properly, how they're going to perform in terms of efficiency if you understand something about L values and R values. So that's why I'm going to cover this stuff. It's, it's just really good foundational stuff. Now, in early C, the C language, L values and R values are fairly straightforward. They're not trivial, but they're not overly complicated. C++, in the, by adding classes, the, the const keyword, and references to the language, complicated what an L value and an R value is. And then it really got messier with the introduction of R value references in modern C++. Now, covering all of this stuff is more than I have time for. So what I've opted to do is I'm going to try to give you what I think is the essentials. The, the goal here is not to cover the intricacies of the language rules. That's why you go out and you look at Stack Overflow, or you get a copy of the standard and you read that. What I want to do is give you the essential knowledge you ne need to just decipher that stuff. And so I'm not going to, to, to really get into the details of, of those subtleties, just give you the broad strokes and why you care about it. <clears throat> So that, that's that part. Let me get some more water. So within C and C++, here's where it all started. Kernahan and Ritchie's book, The C Programming Language, had that quote, which is that the name L value comes from the assignment expression E1 equals E2, in which the left operand E1 must be an L value expression. And then they went on to say, an L value is simply an expression that refers to an object. And an object is just a region of storage. Actually, the, the standard now says something I think that's a little more explicit. It says that an L value, I'm sorry, an object is a region of data storage, the contents of which can hold values, which is a little more useful. 
If you now try to read the, the C++ standard, it turns out they go on for a paragraph or more explaining just what an object is. But, but having this background will help you look at that and say, oh, OK, I see why they're doing all this fine-grained explanation to get all the details right. So let's just look at a very basic example. Right there, you have a declaration for an object n, an assignment statement, n equals 1. And what Kernahan and Ritchie were talking about is that both n and 1 by themselves are sub-expressions. They're participating in a larger assignment, but individually, n by itself and 1 by itself is an expression. In this case, n is designating an object. It's an L value. 1 is a sub-expression that doesn't de designate an object. It's just a value. It's what we call an R value. An R value is simply any expression that isn't an L value. Now, there's a real subtlety here, which is there's, it's an easy tendency to look at that first line, the declaration, and say, oh, that's declaring n as an L value. That's actually a misstatement. It's that L values and R values are properties of expressions. It's what you get when you use it in an expression. It, it exhibits the attribute of being an L value or an R value. Here's a slightly more complicated example. You have non-trivial expressions on the left and right. Both of those, the x sub i plus 1 and the call on the abs function, each of those is an expression. And in order for this assignment statement, any assignment statement to be valid, the sub-expression on the left of the assignment has to be an L value. On the right-hand side, it can be anything, either an L value or an R value. So the, the thing I want to address first is, why do you even care about this? Why does the language go down this path of making this distinction? And the answer is because what it does is it gives the compiler a lot of freedom as to how it can generate code, knowing that our values are not obligated to, to occupy storage. So let's give a concrete example. Again, let's go back to our I seem to have a loose connection here. Let me just take a second to reseat this. It's, it's an R value? Yeah. It's. So let's look in depth at this a simple assignment, n equals 1. Again, 1 is an R value. Here are different code generation strategies that a compiler could use. One is that the compiler could say, I'm going to actually generate storage a word of storage that holds the value 1. And then I will generate code as if 1 is an L value. In other words, I'll go ahead and do a move instruction, which simply says take the contents of 1 and copy it into n. That's one permitted code generation on one, per one particular architecture. But an awful lot of machines have what's known as immediate mode addressing, where for small integer values, 8-bit, 12-bit, it depends on the architecture, they actually put the value as a field within the machine instruction. So there's no data anywhere that holds the value 1. It's part of the code space. And so you get a machine instruction generated like that. And so here, the 1 never appears as data, only as a portion of the instruction. Yet other architectures, some risk architectures, you might find that the most efficient way to get a 1 into an object is to clear it and increment it, as if you had done this. And once again, there's no trace of the 1 anywhere in the data. This is the nature of an R value. It gives the compiler permission to make these kinds of choices. And so. That's one of the reasons why C++ C uses the concept of an R value. Here's another one, is you look at that assignment statement right there, and that's obviously erroneous. The question is, what's the official reason why it's erroneous? It's because the left-hand side has to be an L value, and one is not. This is trying to store a value on top of 
an integer literal, sort of assuming as if there is storage that you can overwrite. Now, we really don't want this to compile. It turns out that, have, have any of you ever programmed in Fortran? In Fortran, you can do that. You can do the equivalent of this through parameter passing by reference. It's a fun little gimmick you can do in a Fortran program. You can actually alter the value of the literal one such that adding one doesn't just add one, it adds something else. And in Fortran, that's considered to be a feature. <laughs> I don't think we want that. And so it, part of what the nature of an R value does is it, it gives a good concept behind why this thing is an erroneous construct. So there's the official reason. It's trying to assign to something that's not an L value. <clears throat> So the brief recap is that this is, again, I'm doing it at the high level. When we, at the tail end of this talk, I'll tell you how modern C++ adds some complication to this. But this is really good foundational stuff for understanding the true state of the way things are in modern C++. So the simplifying, this was true until C++11, that every expression in C and in C++ is either an L value or an R value. An L value is any expression that designates an object, and an R value is anything that doesn't. Now, one other little caveat here is that a guiding principle in the design of C++ is that we try to give uniform rules that govern both the built-in types and the class types just by contrast with a language like Java. In Java, when you pass an argument to a function, if that argument is of a built-in type, the only allowed mechanism is to pass by value. When you pass a class object in Java, the only allowed mechanism is to pass by reference. You can't pass a built-in object by reference, and you can't pass a class object by value. That's just a very cut and dried simple set of rules that makes arguably the language less complicated. But the aspiration in C++ is to have a uniform set of rules for the built-in types and the class types. Operator overloading is a large part of that. But even at a more mundane level, you can take a built-in object and pass it by value, by address, using a pointer, by reference. You can do the same thing with a class. And so, in this spirit, C++ aspires to have the, the rules for L values and R values are the same for built-in objects and class objects, but they're not. It, it breaks down in the edges, in, and, and it's so an area you have to be alert. So right now, though, I'm going to make the simplifying assumption that it doesn't break down, but I, the truth in advertising is that there, there are some corner ca cases, not so uncommon, where um, R values of a class type actually are forced to be treated like objects in that they're guaranteed to occupy storage. But we still call them R values. OK, so numeric literals, integer literals, floating literals, when you use them in expressions, there are values. The same is true for single quoted character literals of a one character. These things are treated as if they don't necessarily occupy storage. In contrast, double quoted character strings are L values. They are guaranteed to occupy storage in memory. <clears throat> you can ex expect that you can point to them. You can take their address. Enumeration constants. Those things, when you use them in expressions, they also act like R values. I've had discussions many times with programmers who are concerned that when they use enumeration types, they're chewing up storage to hold these things. No, compilers are really good at turning these things into purely compiled time values. Now, you can use 
an L value in an R value context. That is, that's a very common thing to do. M equals N. Both sides of the assignment in this case have the inherent property that they are L values. But what's expected on the right-hand side is really, you're not so interested in where it is, you want to know what's in there. So what happens is it fetches that. And there's a formal name for that in C++. It's called an L value to R value conversion. It's treated, in fact, like it's in the table of known conversions that's listed in the standard as just yet another stand, uh, conversion that can be performed. And it's a fancy way for saying, fetch the value in it. See, whereas when M there is used as an L value, you're not interested in the contents of it. In fact, that assignment statement never pays any attention to what's in M. What it's really interested in is an address. L values designate objects when you use L values and expressions, you're primarily interested. The compiler is primarily interested in the address. OK, now these concepts, although the names L value and R value came from assigned bin expressions, turns out these things apply in just about every other operator in the language. One example is the binary plus. Let's take a careful look at that. Now, when the compiler is looking at an expression like m plus n, it has to go through some analysis to make sure that the types are compatible. The question is, what, what can you also say about the properties as far as do the left and the right operand have to be L values or R values? Well, it turns out in this case, the left operand could be an L value or an R value. The right operand could be an L value or an R value. They're both permitted. So the, the, the restrictions that you get with assignment don't apply in the binary plus. But the binary plus has an, a different interesting property. What about the result? When you add n plus n, you expect the result doesn't go into m. It doesn't go into n. It's got to go somewhere else. And that somewhere else is a compiler-generated temporary object. Almost always, it's a CPU register, but it's not necessarily that. It could be a memory location. The compiler is responsible for picking that, that, that spot where it puts the temporary value. And the nature of temporary objects that is really important is they are R values. Now, why are they treat now the thing is that it might actually to be taking up space, but why do we consider them R values? It's because you're not guaranteed about where that space is and how long it lasts. It's, you don't, unlike a named object where you say, I know it's there and I can take its address, this thing is really being managed out of your control. And the notion of being able to take its address and hold on to it, language doesn't want to let you do that, and rightly so. Now, let's do an analysis on that right there. m plus 1 equals n. Again, you look at that and you say, that can't be right. I hope the compiler flags it as an error. Well, first of all, it, the precedence of operators is such that it's going to group the plus before it does the equals. So now the question is, what is the nature of that result m plus 1? And the answer is, well, it's the result of an add, it's an R value. The official reason why that's an error is because it's attempting to assign to an R value. And that is exactly, well, not exactly, that's, you, sometimes you get a message that says left operand must be an L value, or sometimes it says it can't be an R value, depending upon what mood the compiler writer was in. But the answer is pretty much the same. Let's look at a couple other operators just to beat this concept to death. The unary address of operator. What has to be the nature of the operand E? It can't be an R value. It has to be an L value. That's why address of 3 is an error. 3 doesn't refer to an object. So in the example, those bottom two lines there, 
that reference to taking the address of n, that's perfectly OK, because when you use n in that expression, that's an L value. But the result of the whole address of expression, that's R value. Because it's not putting the answer in n. It's putting it in a compiler-generated temporary. And you shouldn't be allowed to assign to that. Now, let's compare the address of operator to the dereference operator, the unary star. So if you say star p, well, pointers point to objects. They point to addressable things. When you dereference and say, give me the thing that it points to, that's an L value. But now, look, let's look at the third line there, declaring char star s equals null, or in modern C++ equals null put. Is that s pointing to an object? Not really. But it turns out, this is a real important subtlety, is L value is not a runtime property. It's a compile time property. In other words, the compiler is just going to look at the expression, star s, and say s is a pointer, star s is the thing it points to. And irrespective of whether or not s contains a valid value at the time, the compilers are analyzing all of this L valueness at compile time and ignoring the value of s. So then how do we treat the, the issue of what happens if s contains an invalid value? Well, that's why we talk about undefined behavior. Undefined behavior is simply what you get when you step into a hole that can't be, in general, caught at compile time. <clears throat> Pardon? Well, the thing is, it will. It can't, this is the kind of error that can't be caught, well, in general, can't be caught at compile time. A, good, a compiler with good flow analysis may be able to say, oh, by the time I get to there, S is still has the null value in it, and I'm one of the permitted things that a compiler can do in the case of undefined behavior is give a compile error. But if the assignment to null, the, the fact that s has an invalid value, is invisible to the compiler during compile time because it was set remotely, passed in as an argument, then it just says, all I see is that s is a pointer, star s is an l value. And, it, and you'll get whatever undefined behavior happens when you dereference an invalid pointer. OK, now, although the result of the star operator is an L value, the operand of the star doesn't have to be an L value. I mean, usually you write things like star p and star s. But right there, there's an expression star of p plus 1. p plus 1 itself is an R value. But it's immediately being dereferenced, and so the result is an L value. And so you can proceed to store into it, even though a portion of the evaluation of the expression yields an R value, which normally couldn't occur on the left-hand side of the assignment, because there's a further operation applied. You wind up that the totality of the left-hand side is it's an L value. Pardon? Was a const pointer? Um, oh, we, uh, hold that thought about const, because all of this discussion, I haven't mentioned const yet. And just when you think you understand this, I'll throw const in there, and it'll complicate the rules. I'm doing this incrementally. So, OK, so here's the summary of what we've covered so far, which is conceptually, our values are, don't occupy data storage. Now, in truth, some of them might. For example, I don't know of an architecture that has immediate mode floating values. You know, immediate mode integer values are common, but usually things like floating point values have to be stored as if they were L values. 
But the management of that is out of your hands. The compiler says, if I need to, I'll generate one, but you have to act as if it doesn't occupy storage. In contrast, L values of any type conceptually occupy storage. They designate objects. Now, the truth is the compiler's optimizer is allowed to optimize them away if it thinks you won't notice that they're missing. Like if it notices there are two integer variables in a single scope and the two integer variables are never used concurrently, it could say, I'll collapse them into one. But as soon as you do something like compare the addresses of those two, the compiler has to split them up to make them appear as if they're different objects. So you, you proceed to program as if L values occupy storage. Now, here's your, here's your const, is that in fact not all L values can appear on the left-hand side, and that's because there is this concept called a non-modifiable L value. If you const qualify an expression, then it, it's, a, it's still designating an object. There is storage there, but it's declared to be const. So for example, I've got that array called name. And what does it mean for an array to be constant? Well, it means each element is constant. If you subscript it, what you get as a result is a constant character object. And because it's const, you can't assign to it. But it does occupy storage, and you can point to it. So L values and R values now give us a vocabulary for describing some subtleties. Like, here's one. Um, certainly when I programmed in C, I developed an affinity for using enumeration constants in place of hash defines. Because in C, const doesn't work for symbolic constants the way it does in C++. And so you can, instead of using a hash define, can write that, which says that max is an, an unnamed enumeration type, which is equal to an object, uh, actually a value equal to 100. And when you have an unnamed enumeration type like this and you use it in an expression, it gets treated like it's an int. But because it's an, when you use it in expression, it's an R value, you can't put it on the left-hand side of an assignment. And because it's an R value, you can't take its address. So, so you have to act as if this thing is not a real object, which it isn't. Now compare that with the C++ notion of a constant object. Turns out when you use that max in an expression, it's a non-modifiable L value. Now, once again, you can't do an assignment to but not because it's an R value, it's because it's a non-modifiable L value. But here's where the difference shows up. You can take the address of it. It's not something you commonly do, but the capability is there because a constant object is an object, and when you use it in an expression, it acts like an L value because that's what it is. Now, what's the consequence of doing that? See, it, the usual treatment of constant objects, constant integer valued objects in C++ is that if it doesn't have to generate storage for the object, it won't. But this is forcing the compiler to generate storage for a constant object. It will actually lay down storage and put the value 100 into that location so that that pointer can point to it. So this little subtlety here, the difference between an L value and an R value, is gives you a tool. I don't know how useful it is to you, but if you want to have a symbolic constant where you want to compel the compiler not to be able to take the address of it, use an enumeration constant. But if you don't care if somebody takes the address of it somewhere and the compiler generates a copy, you can use a constant object. Yes? No, the question was if, if it generates the storage to satisfy that pointer there, 
will it then take all references to Max and make them refer to that location? And the answer is no. It can still optimize the, as a... What? Oh, well, but, it, but then you would be, say, if you want to change that location and have everybody refer to it. But once you start changing the, the value of a constant object, you're in the twilight zone of undefined behavior. So your program isn't, by definition, valid at that point. So all bets are off as to how it works. Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, the, he was mentioning something about the behavior of references, which we will get to shortly. Yes, we'll build on that. Yes? I was wondering if the compiler can change uh, uh, address for Max or, or eliminate Max from the target? Well, l l l let me try again and see if this answers your question. In the, people rarely do what's on that bottom line. You know, most of the time, we just declare, define constant objects like that. And the compiler treats them as purely symbolic information. And the vast majority of times, it never generates any storage to hold max. It will just use max in context to dimension arrays or you know, whatever it is that it's being used for. Often, it will wind up as an immediate operand and an instruction, that sort of thing. The only time that the compiler would be compelled to generate storage is if you force it by taking its address. Yeah, you can then you could take that pointer p and pass it around, and and everybody would be referring to that same copy. Yes. Yeah. OK, so here's a summary of the difference between L values, non-modifiable L values, and R values. That an L value is an object that takes up storage. You can point to it. You can store into it. R values are these, in a sense, vaporous objects. <laughs> they don't take up storage. And because they don't take up storage, you can't store into them, and you can't point to them. And non-modifiable L values are in this in-between in state where they do take up storage conceptually, but because they are non-modifiable, they're constant, you can't store into them. Now, in that previous example I showed you about a constant object is addressable, what happens is that means the compiler might generate storage for it. But the reality is that the compilers are actively doing analysis to find out, do I really need to generate that storage? And if it doesn't, it won't. And that's what happens almost all the time. Yes? If you actually, this is a subtlety back here, which is, that declaration, that definition of int const max equals 100, if it appears at namespace scope, in, that's in a namespace or at the global scope, it acts as if it has the keyword static in front of it already. It has internal linkage. It's not external. The only way you can make a constant object have linkage across translation units is by explicitly putting the keyword external in front of it. OK, back to here. Now, there is a real analogy between the behavior of const objects and the behavior of inline functions. Because with an inline function, you're not guaranteed that it will be inlined. But most of the time these days, compilers do it. But, any, but if the compiler decides that it can't inline the function, it generates a non-inline copy. And you can take its address. And you can point to it. And const objects are the same thing. The compiler's trying hard to avoid generating storage form, but if you force it to, it'll generate that storage, and you can point to it. 
Okay, now let's get to references. References provide an alternative to pointers as a way of associating names with objects. And these things are very prevalent in C++, and what I want to show you, really can't talk meaningfully about references without talking about L values and R values. So just a, a brief reminder, what I'm talking about here is there's an integer object i, and, on, and there's a, a reference object, a variable. Ri is referring to i. And um, the dirty little secret that nobody likes to talk about is that really, references are implemented as pointers. The standard goes to great lengths to never say this. They just say references are aliases and things. But in fact, you can write code like the stuff on the left and write the code on the right and then run that through the compiler, look at the generated code, and you'll see the same thing. But it's an open secret. The standard goes to great lengths to never admit that. So, pardon? That's right. So a reference acts like a pointer that always has a star in front of it, and it yields, because the star operator yields an L value, it turns out user, using a reference in an expression yields an L value as well. But if, you, but if you take the address of CPI, you'll get the address of I, of star CPI. It's, 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 the comparison is if you take the address of RI, you get the address of I. If you take the address of star CPI, Uh, let's, can we take this one offline? Okay, I'm happy to talk to you about it at the end of this session. So again, you, you, you already know this, that assigning and initializing are, are look a lot alike, but they're not quite the same. Let's just go on. So here's the thing I want to address is, having taught C++ for many, many years, especially having taught it to C programmers, a common reaction I get from C programmers is, pointers are hard enough when you can see the stars. Why on earth would I ever use a reference that's a pointer with the stars hidden? And it turns out that the real reason for this is that they make for friendlier interfaces. And in particular, I think the killer examples to illustrate the use of references all have to do with operator overloading is that operator overloading doesn't come out right if you don't use references. And it's because of the L value properties that we need in overloaded operators. So let's just look at one example. This is an enumerated type for the months of the year on the, on, on the, uh, the calendar that everybody else uses. And, um, and what I want to be able to do here is iterate for, for a month starting at January and going up to and including December. And if I were programming in C, I could just do this and say plus plus M to get me to the next month, and it would work. It compiles and does exactly what I expect. But it doesn't compile in C given that little bit of code. And the reason is because C++ enumerations as distinct from the integers. And one of the consequences is that arithmetic on enumerations is more restrictive, including the built-in plus-plus operator is not supported for enumeration types. So what you need to do is implement a plus-plus operator. And let's try to do it without references first. One way to do it would be to write an operator plus-plus that takes a month passed by value. Now, what happens is when you do that, the expression plus plus m looks right. I mean, syntactically, it looks like you expect it to look. 
The problem is that because the function is passing by value, it's making a copy of m into x. And inside the body of the function, it's incrementing x and then saying, gee, that was fun, and throws it away. m is unchanged. What we need is a parameter passing mechanism which will pass in the value of m and, and change it. And if you don't have references, the only way you can do that, oh, by the way, I should mention, one of the other consequences of this is that you can increment April, where April is an R value. That would compile. But we actually want that to not compile, because for the same reason that we don't want that to compile. You shouldn't be, you see, 42 is an integer. Could you increment an int? Yes, you can. But should you be allowed to increment an integer literal so that it now has the value 43? No, not unless you want to program in Fortran. <clears throat> so we can try to do it that way. And if you do it with a passing by address, the problem is that plus plus m no longer compiles because this operator plus plus is expecting a pointer to be passed in. So you have to write it as plus plus ampersand m. That will compile, but it doesn't look right. It, that ampersand ruins everything. The whole point of operator overloading is it should look the same, not similar, but the same as the built-in one. So that's why we use a reference. Would it compile because the ampersand m is an R value and you are not allowed to increment R values? Oh. Um, no. Plus plus appears. Oh, yes. You're, you're, you're correct. Oh, that, that is a, let's take that, that's a good question, yes. That might not compile, so I'm, that slide might be erroneous, let's, let's think about that afterwards. But the point is, we want to do it that way. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. The const? Well, hold that thought. Let me just get through this, and then we'll, we'll consider the variations. So anyway, a, 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 the proper way to pass the argument to a, something like the plus plus operator is to use a reference parameter like this. And that way you can write plus plus m and, um, and it compiles increments and, and it looks the way it should. And the other nice property you get is that it rejects that because you can't bind a reference to an R value. You can only bind it to an L value. Or maybe this. What? When it is this, you can. Uh, const function, const member function contains a temporary this. Well, at the, at the beginning of my discussion, I, I said there's going to be some corner cases I'm going to gloss over intentionally because I only have a few minutes left. Okay. So, yeah, the, 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 what I'm trying to do is give you the broad picture of how this stuff works. Uh, okay. Now, in truth, a properly written plus plus operator doesn't have a void return. It returns a reference to the incremented object. I'm talking about the prefix one. The postfix one is another small a uh, can of worms, which I'm, I'm not going to cover for reasons of time. Now, why do we do it that way? The answer is because you want to be able to write things like that, that mimic the behavior of the built-in plus plus. Okay, let's talk about reference to const for a moment. Uh, just as you can have pointers to const, you can have references to const. It's commonly used in function parameters like that. 
And the reference to const can bind to um, arguments that are either const or non-const. But if you have just a reference, not a reference to const, that will only bind to, to a non-const object. And when you use a reference to const in an expression, it too acts like a non-modifiable L value. The fact that you're using a reference means you have an L value, but the fact that it's const qualified means it's not modifiable. Okay, now passing by reference to const is often compared with passing by value. In fact, a common decision that you have to make when you're designing function interfaces is, do I want to pass the argument by, if I have an argument, <laughs> that I want to pass in and not permit the function to alter, should I pass by value or should I pass by reference to const? And the answer turns out um, to be a matter of performance. At either way that you write the function, whether you use passing by reference to const or passing by value, the call looks the same. It looks like pass by value. But if it is actually passed by value, the reason you can't alter the actual argument is because all the function gets is a copy. If it's passing by reference to const, it's getting a reference back to the original, but it's declared const, so you, the function can't alter it. And as I mentioned, the reason for making this choice is that it depends on how expensive that copy is. Now, what I want to do is point out a, there's a real subtlety in uh, the reference binding rules that a lot of people aren't aware of, and I want to point it out to you. And again, it, it illustrates the power of understanding L values and R values. Is that, in general, a pointer to T can only point to an L value of type T. And a reference to a T can only bind to an L value of type T, right there, right? The pointer PI can't point to three because you can't take the address of three. You can't bind a reference to three. Three is not an L value. Also, the type of, just as the type of a pointer has to match the pointer value being assigned to it, you can't take a reference to a double and bind it to something that isn't a double. That makes a lot of sense to me. But here is this little exceptional case where it turns out, here's the rule, is that a reference to constant t can bind to an expression x that's not an L value of type t but only if there is a conversion, an, Im an implicit conversion, from x's type to t. And in that case, what the compiler does is it manufactures a temporary object to hold that converted result. So here are a couple of examples. Right there, you can't, see, if we took away that const, that statement would be an illegal declaration. But the presence of the const there says the compiler will go ahead and create a temporary object to hold the three. It'll bind the reference to it. And it will leave that reference bound to that temporary object as long as the, that reference is alive. And when you get to the end of the lifetime of that reference, not only does the reference go away, but the temporary goes away. Here's another example. In this case, I've got a reference RD that I'm binding. And, and the RI on the right, that's also a reference, but it's a reference of the wrong type, which means that RI there will be evaluated to be an L value of type int, but it's the wrong type for binding a reference to a double. Yet that declaration compiles. And what will happen is it will create a temporary double object, take the value referenced by RI, convert it into double, a temporary. It'll bind the reference to that thing, and it'll use that as long as the reference RD is alive. 
And when RD goes away, the temporary goes away. Yes. RI. It could be. It could be on the stack. If that thing is declared as a local variable. Yes. If it's a global. Yeah, okay. We, that well, that is the definition, and the compiler would probably allocate storage in a in the static data area. Yes. I'm, I'll be happy to answer that question at the end, okay, because we got a lot of people here and only a few minutes left. I'd like to finish my slides. Um, the, the question that's really interesting is, why does C++ support this behavior? And the answer is because we want the behavior of pass by value and pass by reference to const to look the same in all cases. So for example here, if we have a function f that takes a long double, and we pass it x, which is also a long double, what does it do? It, it works and it makes a copy. But if we call function f and we pass it something that isn't a long double, what do we expect it to do? To take the one, convert it to a long double, and copy it into the argument, the parameter ld. That's not surprising. Well, now, if we decide that it, we'd get better performance by passing by reference to const, we don't want it to break any function calls, right? So what happens is, if the parameter is declared as reference to const, and you call f of x, it will simply bind the reference to x. But if you pass in 1, what does it do? It makes a temporary object of type long double, puts the one properly converted into that location, and binds the reference to it. <clears throat> and so that way, when you're inside the function, LD appears to be a non-modifiable L value. Consistently, no matter what kind of argument was passed in, when you arrive inside the function, LD appears to be a non-modifiable L value. <clears throat> now, once again, if you take away the const, the second call won't compile, because the reference binding requires when you, that it, it bind to an L value when it's a, no, a reference to non-const. But if it's reference to const, it'll take anything that's convertible, L value or R value. OK. now. Let's go back and look at the, the plus operator, just to remind you. Remember, the operand can be either L values or R values, but the result always has to be an R value. So when you're declaring an overloaded operator, an operator plus, you want to mimic that same behavior. You want to make sure that an overloaded plus operator looks like it will take either L values or R values, that's the operands, but will return an R value. How do you do that? Fairly simple. Let's choose as our illustration some string, character string class. The character string class has a, uh, a, the usual copy constructor and copy assignment op operators, but it also has a converting constructor. That's a constructor that can be used to, to convert, for example, a null terminated character sequence into a string class object. And we also have our binary plus operator. And notice that the left and right operands are both declared as references to constant strings. Those references will bind to either L values or R values. Both west constants. What? Both west constants. Oh, that's yeah, got a typo in there. Yes. I'm an e-monster. That's a mistake. Um, and 
Um, so now let's just see a usage of that. Uh, I create two string objects, S and T, and then I write the expression S plus, and there's a double quoted character string, and, and T. Now it, in that usage, on the right hand side of the assignment, S is an L value, T is an L value. It turns out that the double quoted string is also an L value, but it's the wrong type. Our plus operator that I just showed you will not take a string literal as an operand. So what does the compiler do? It notices that there's a conversion that will do that. It applies the converting constructor to that string literal like this. And now that middle operand, what's its nature? It's an R value, right? But this works. It's a plus operator that will accept a mixture of L values and R values. But what about the result? Notice the return type is plain old string. Not a reference to a string or a point, it's a string. When you see a function that returns by value, that's an R value. And the way you can demonstrate it is, if you try doing something like that, you take the address of the result of S plus T, you can't take the address of an R value. OK, now, I'll just give you a glimpse of the mess that C++11 made of this, which is that what we used to call references are now called L-value references. And that's to distinguish them from R-value references. R-value references were introduced into the language to support move operations. And so the notation is to use the double ampersand. And the rule for binding R value references is, let's go back a second. What are now called L value references bind only to L values unless the reference is const. R value references bind only to R values. OK, if you try to do something like, like uh, I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, you, you commonly like L value references, you use these things for um, parameters and return types on functions. You can declare a R value reference to a constant something, however, it's not something that one commonly does. But if you do try to do things like bind an R value reference, like on the next to last line there, that's an error. You can't bind an R value reference to an L value. Now, how does this binding work? Binding an R value reference to an R value creates a temporary. You know, it, 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 it's bound to a, a manufactured temporary object that holds that thing. And so the, the reason that they're in there is to support these move operations. And what the move operations are about, it's an attempt to say, it's most commonly used in situations where you say, this expression has manufactured a temporary R value object, and it's about to die. It's about to reach the end of its lifetime, and I want to copy it from here to here. And before there were move operations, it used to be that the copy would say, OK, if you have resources that you're managing over here, instead of my being able to just steal those resources, I had to make a whole new copy of it over here and copy that stuff. Move operations support the ability to say, oh, you're about to die. You don't need that stuff anymore. I'll just steal it before you get a chance to destroy it and you get a performance gain. And so all of this stuff is about being able to identify <laughs> objects that are about to reach the end of their lifetime. And so modern C++ has extended the nomenclature of L values and R values. They've added this extra one now called an X value. An X value stands for an expiring value. It means it's about to die. And therefore, you can steal what it owns before it gets a chance to destroy it itself. And in order to keep the old wording of the standard, 
as much as possible. They wound up, they kept the terms L value and R value, but introduced two more, GL value and PR value. PR value stands for pure R value. And most of the things that like literals, integer, those now become PR values. They're still R values, but now they're pure R values as well. And a GL value is simply an, an L value that might also be one of these expiring values. And there are certain contexts where you'll say, I'll take a an L value that's going to last or something that's about to expire. And that broader category handles that. Anyway, I hope this gives you a little found, enough foundation so that the next time people mutter this stuff at you, you have a fighting chance of understanding what they're talking about. You know, it's hard stuff. It really it takes a lot of work to master this, but it starts with these basic concepts. And I think that the general model that I've given you is largely reflects even the current reality. So thank you. <laughs>